if Scott wouldn't mind. Scott, if you would state your full name. Certainly. My name is Scott Keim. I'm a Deputy Attorney General with the Office of the Attorney General here in Idaho, and I am in the Health and Human Services Division working with the Child Support Program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I appreciate you, you taking this because you did not testify. But I take my constitutional oath very seriously. And I don't know that I feel comfortable where we are constitutionally on this. Now, I know that Congress did give its consent and advice with the caveat that the states sign on. Um, there's been several people testify as to the fact that this is not constitutional. I would like an official AG opinion on whether or not we are violating our constitutional oath. Mr. Kime. Madam Chairman, uh, Representative Trujillo, there have been discussions of actually multiple different provisions of the United States Constitution. Uh, the primary one that seems to be uh, discussed today is whether or not this enacting of this legislation would constitute a treaty directly between the state of Idaho and a foreign nation. And that issue um, has not had a formal Attorney General's opinion presented. However, as you indicated, the treaty has already been drafted. The advice and consent has been passed by the United States Senate. So it is a treaty between the United States and signing on to this convention. The mechanism that has been taken from that point in time is that the Senate, or rather Health and Human Services has been provided with, or the State, State Department, correct? I would like to correct, has been provided with that consent and advice document. However, they are withholding submission of the, the advice and consent document, which is the final step in authorizing the treat, treaty, until each of the states have implemented the state statutes necessary for the United States to participate on a nationwide basis. So it is my opinion that this does not constitute a direct treaty-making effort between the state of Idaho and any foreign country. It is simply effectuating changes in state law which allow the United States to finalize its nationwide advice and consent and treaty. Follow-up? Representative? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if, if this was such a good thing for the states, why the punitive coercion? And is that, would that play into our constitutionality as far as we basically are having our arms twisted by the feds because they are going to harm our most vulnerable children if we choose not to do this? Mr. Kane. Madam Chairman, Representative Trujillo. At that point in time, you're talking about an issue which centers on the spending clause. The spending clause of the United States Constitution authorizes the federal government to um, spend United States taxpayer funds and authorize programs throughout the various states. The there was a brief mention earlier of National Federation of Independent Businesses, which is the uh, United States Supreme Court case which decided um, and struck down certain provisions of the Affordable Care Act as being overtly punitive. Um, the analysis has actually been conducted of a possible uh, challenge to this legislation by the Office of the Attorney General, and it is the opinion of the Office of the Attorney General that the prospects of prevailing on a challenge to the spending clause 
um, issue in this case is in no, no means clear and, in fact, skeptical at best. Madam Chair, may I have a follow-up? Okay. One, this last one. Thank you. In regards to that, and I want it pointed out, that is because this does not affect enough money within the state. Is that correct? There are, it's a budgetary limit. Mr. Kime? Chairman, uh, Representative Trujillo, that is, in fact, a very significant portion of the analysis because the fact that you are looking at somewhere between 0.2% and 0.7% of the state financial budget um, that is tied to the financial and spending clause issues in this particular case. Whereas the Medicaid case dealt with, if we look at the state of Idaho's budget, it would be 20%. So you're talking a difference of three orders of magnitude. So that kind of contradicts yes. the numbers that we have thro being thrown around and, and that, that are out there. I, I, and just as a point of clarification, the, the figures I'm looking at is $16 million in child support funding as compared to the full state budget for fiscal year 2014. It comes to point two point. Yes, 0.2% of the state budget in fiscal year 2014. If you add in the additional $30 million to come to the 46 billion, the $30 million of the TANF grant to come to the 46 million, you're talking about 0.7% of the statewide budget. And that is a good, re good portion of the analysis is that although these are large figures as it relates to this particular program on a statewide basis, they are not nearly as large when you're looking across all programs as, you, as we were looking at with regards to the Medicaid expansion provision of the ACA. Thank you. Madam Chairman. Senator Sousa. Senator Sousa. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Klein, thank you. Um, I appreciate you being here to represent the AG's office and give us some legal advice. So on the point that Representative Trujillo was just making, I happen to have been sent by a constituent parts of uh, Justice Roberts, Supreme Court Justice Roberts' uh, statement or his review of the case that you were just referring to with the uh, Affordable Care Act and the Medicaid. And on page 20 of, that, of his opinion, I believe it says, and let me find the right spot, um, that and by the way, I, I believe that I was the person that asked for the AG's opinion having to do with this to begin with uh, here in Idaho. So, so um, Mr. Kane gave me the feedback in a seven-page response that as a percentage of overall budget, this would, he didn't believe that this would come to uh, the, rise to the level. But in, in Justice Roberts' opinion, he says, let me see, um, that instead of simply refusing to grant the new funds to the state that will not accept the new condition, Congress has also threatened to withhold those states' existing Medicaid funds. The states claim that this threat serves no purpose other than to force unwilling states to sign up for the dramatic expansion health care coverage affected by the Act. Given the nature and the threat and the programs at issue, here we must agree. So it, it appears that Justice Roberts was saying that it's not just the fact that they were threatening to withhold money for the new Medicaid expansion, it's that they were pulling the money for the existing program as well. And as you just explained, that's exactly what the federal government is, is threatening to do here with the child support system that we have in place already. So do you, what is your opinion of the uh, comparison there on those? Mr. Kane. Uh, Madam Chairman, Senator Souza, that analysis touches on two points that uh, Justice Roberts was making. However, he goes much further and he analyzes the fact that 
That was because, in his opinion, he viewed Medicaid expansion as a complete transformation of the Medicaid program. Whereas, when you look at the issues related to this particular piece of legislation, the language is almost identical to the vast majority of what is already set forth in UFSA. And we are only dealing with approximately 20 new countries that are involved it, at this point in time. But between those countries that the United States and or the state of Idaho may already have existing reciprocity agreements with and those that are signed up under the Hague. The other aspect is that the provisions in this legislation actually provide greater protections against due process concerns and um, personal jurisdiction issues than are in the existing statute as it sits presently in Idaho code. Madam Chair, a follow-up? Yes, Senator Sousa. Thank you. Mr. Klein, thank you. Um, I do think that perhaps we are looking at a substantial change. It is in, in when we're talking about this child uh, support issue, because now for the very first time, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I believe it's not only in Idaho history, but in U.S. history, having this um, language of a foreign treaty being blended into existing state law has not been done before. Is that correct? Mr. Kime. Um, thank you, Senator Lodge. Uh, Senator Sousa. Actually, there are a number of different areas in which there are foreign treaties that have procedures laid, for, laid forth in both state and federal law, particularly as it relates to issues of um, <laughs> Interference with um, parental custody, the International um, Child Abduction Act, things, things of that nature, a lot of those already have procedures that are set forth in a treaty with mirroring procedures that are set forth in, in state code. Uh, the, other as, the other avenue where you find those are on issues of rendition in criminal cases and um, the, the way that, uh, uh, let me back up, rendition or uh, extradition is handled. And those extradition treaties are, are tied to um, the provisions in both state and federal code quite often outlining the procedures on which extradition is handled. Madam Chair, just one quick additional This will be question. the last one. Yes, thank you. Mr. Klein, thank you. I just, I'm just curious, and I, I don't want to get the wrong impression, so I, if you could just clarify for me. You said that um, those, those are already in federal, uh, federal law that has been put into state code. But we're talking international treaty that it's, the states are compelled to include in their state code, the state statute, in order to achieve uh, to avoid a, a punishment or a penalty. Has that happened before in, in the, the history of Idaho that you can, that you can recall? Mr. Kaim, do you have that information on hand? Does that have to have some, have some research? Uh, Chairman Senator Sousa, I do not have specifics regarded to, to that very narrow question. However, I, one thing that is kind of inherent in your question is the idea that this is a, a punishment. And I, it's very difficult not to look at it in that manner, but it's no different uh, from a state agency. The department is only given authority to enter into certain contracts or take certain activities, uh, and that's pursuant to statute. In this case, that same sort of thing happened at the federal level. Congress changed the requirements for state participation in the child support enforcement program and child support funding. Once those 
requirements were changed, Health and Human Services, the Office of Child Support Enforcement, did not have discretion to allow or to continue to fund those services unless the state's statute matches the requirements for participation in those activities. Thank you. Representative Scott, last question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my first question for you, Scott, and I'm going to kind of put it all together so it comes out as one question. So um, I, I, I have a lot of questions, and I think this is a very serious matter, and I think we need to have all our questions answered. So my question is going to be kind of long. So my question is um, our state constitution, Article 1, in Section 2, it says all, um, all political power is inherent in the people, and the government is instituted for their equal protection, and they have the right to alter, reform, or abolish the same whenever they deem it necessary. And I, I'm not going to ask the question yet. And so um, apparently, page 1 through 32 of this language um, that's, that is from an international treaty um, we are not, it has to be verbatim. And, and my question is, can you tell me how that ensures that the people um, have the right to alter? And would you be willing to put um, some of your statements in writing? Um, of, I understand a verbal, but I, I'd like to see um, the Attorney General's opinion in writing for several of these critical constitutional questions. So we're very sure on, on where the state stands on these issues. Thank you. Um, that sounded kind of like a statement. So, um, well, Would you be willing to put it in writing? How's that? Uh, I think that's going to take yeah. some research, and it's also going to, to take um, some collaboration. Chair Chairman Representative Scott, um, as it relates to the spending clause issue, uh, which I just finished discussing with uh, Senator Sousa, she has actually received a, an opinion in writing on that issue, and uh, as that is her, her opinion, she has the ability to share it with anyone that she would like. Um, if the if you would like to request an additional opinion that can be prepared at any point in time however there will be a uh, period of research and preparation that would be required before it could be f formalized and, and presented to you as far as your your question about article 1 section uh, of the Idaho Constitution I, I at least want to address that in that um, you're correct the requirement from the federal government is if the state of Idaho wants to continue to participate in the federal child support enforcement program that those provisions of the Uniform Act have to be passed essentially verbatim it allows for changes to match Idaho nomenclature but the substance is not to be altered or amended. Only, and as the director mentioned, not the entire uh, provision is tied to the um, treaty or the convention. Only sections um, 47 through Fifty nine, starting on page twenty five and continuing to thirty one, are tied to the treaty. But as it relates to your Article One question, you are fully capable of choosing not to pass this legislation. That is your right as as legislators. But if you're going to make that choice and decision 
um, and maybe I'm speaking a little bit out of turn, but it seems the prudent measure is to make alternative um, means to continue the enforcement agency possible. My question is for the people to alter it um, through referendum or, or what have you. You're saying they can't alter it or they can? They, uh, Chairman, yes. uh, Representative Scott, the people can alter it. Whether or not that altered version would be considered to be in compliance with the federal requirement and therefore allow for Idaho to continue in participation with the federal agency is where the issue lies. Okay. Representative Nate, your last question. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Mr. Keim. Thank you for coming again today and, and uh, visiting with us and um, giving us uh, your insights. Um, just uh, your analogy you used a moment ago about the state's relationship with agencies, that agencies uh, kind of must do what the state says and kind of analogizing out to with what the federal government does with the states. I think it's a flawed analogy because the agencies um, are creations of the state legislatures, whereas the federal government is the creation of the states, not the other way around. Uh, Rep or Senator Souza makes an excellent point there that, that this test really hasn't been done before, that uh, the federal government has used coercion to get states to do things by expanding or changing programs and threatening funding for it. But uh, to my knowledge, the, they haven't done this in order to get a treaty ratified. This requires all 50 states to ratify the treaty. And the federal government, using this coercive tactic, I don't care if it's $1, $16 million, or $46 million, that seems to be a different uh, scenario than simply trying to get Medicaid passed as part of the Affordable Care Act. Um, my question is, is that uh, the Attorney General's office is providing opinion to the state legislature today. It doesn't mean that that opinion is always right, does it? There have been wrong opinions offered to the state legislature before. Mr. Kime. Uh, Chairman, Representative Nate, um, first to your point about my analogy. My analogy was not that the states were a, what I was tying it, trying to point out is that Congress placed a limitation upon the, oblig or the abilities and um, powers of the Department of Health and Human Services for the expenditure of funds. That was the analogy I was trying to tie in. Not that the uh, United States or Congress directly commandeered or required uh, the state legislature to pass this legislation. It was tied to the um, spending issue. The other... Uh, Fine. Thank you. Thank you. All right, committee and all of you, I'd like to thank you for all your patience. Um, we've had several hours of, um, of testimony, and we've had some questions answered from members of the committee. And at um, this time, I'm going to turn it over to Representative Wills, who will state what's going to be happening next. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> and I want to uh, thank you for doing an excellent job today. I know everyone is very, very uh, tired. It's been a long, arduous day. We still have... Uh, some uh, things we have to take care of before this day is over, so we need to move forward with this. I'm, I would like to, uh, Madam Chair, upon your uh, determination of, the, uh, of both committees being together, uh, take about a 10-minute recess. We'll come back. Uh, we'll, we'll meet here with the uh, House uh, committee, and we will uh, take a vote. <laughs>